You may have already guessed our next adventure, Friday the 13th, the series. When you mention the title of the show, people will obviously say, The one with Jason? It's an easy mishap, so to speak. Of course, you say Friday the 13th, most minds will wonder there. However, there's no series with Jason involved. The title was just a clever gimmick to pique the interest of viewers who are familiar with the movie series. This kind of went horribly wrong, though. Remember when Halloween made a Halloween movie without Michael Myers? Yeah, you do. And it's rad. Okay, initially Halloween 3 got a thorough slice and dice at the box office, though later it becomes the cult classic that divides fans. Sometimes to a hilarious result. Well, both strategies pay off and sometimes they don't. In this case, creators Frank Mancuso Jr. and Larry B. Williams were lucky. Though Mancuso was a producer on the Jason movies, that was the only link the show had to the movie series of the same name. Never do you see, hear, or get any Jason Easter eggs in the whole show. Oh, and John D. LeMay happened to end up as the lead in Jason Goes to Hell. The premise of this show is as follows. Louis Vendretti made a deal with the devil to sell cursed antiques, but he broke the pact, and it cost him his soul. Now his niece Mickey and her cousin Ryan have inherited the store, and with it, the curse. They must get everything back, and the real terror begins. Oh, and Uncle Lewis's old friend and partner Jack helps the original Scooby gang locate the artifacts and fight off evil sorcerers and pirate ghosts. He's my favorite. He's the if-he-dies-we-riot character for me. To start with, it's genuinely a good series. You care about the characters right off the bat. Most of the episodes will draw you in. There were several times when I would have to stop in the middle of one, and then for the rest of the day I would be like, did the doctor end up shanking those skateboard kids? Like, I had to know. Or, is Jack going to make it out of this? Oh, or my all-time favorite. Will Ryan and Mickey remember their cousins? Hint, one of them remembers, but it's not a big deal because they're only cousins by marriage. The two were made cousins so that there was no buzz around a relationship pulling away from the focus of the show. Guess what? People are still going to ship characters no matter how weird the scenario. Ryan still makes flirty comments at Mickey despite their somewhat relation. The two obviously care for one another, and that only grows as the show goes on. All that to say, there was still interest in the two for fans romantically. I want to thank you guys for watching horror TV shows we missed. And ask if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. During the run, they were doing graphic kills, killer special effects, and so many more things shows were not doing at the time. The show was actually nominated for an Emmy for Outstanding Achievement in Special Visual Effects. They didn't win, but the fact that they were nominated was a huge deal in itself at the time. The show went into syndication in a pairing with Star Trek Next Gen. Talk about a sweet deal. By the end of both of their seasons, the show ranked number one and number two in the ratings. This was all good for a matter of time. The plot itself was also cool. You have an artifact each episode with a weird backstory that's then paired with the fact that there's a 99.9% .9 chance that you're going to commit some kind of heinous crime. I was always trying to guess what was going to happen um, or what the story would be behind each object. Something else noteworthy. I never wanted to skip the intro. As I've said in previous episodes, several of these horror shows had intros that were downright terrifying. This one, while kind of creepy, is also so very cool. I always feel like I spot something new in the shop when I watch it. Like, oh, look, what's in the mirror over there? But that theme uh, from Fred Mullen slaps. He also did the theme for Forever Night, which I'm sure we will get into in a future episode. Speaking of episodes, here are our favorites. The Inheritance. Dolls are creepy, right? Have you seen those ads where people are trying to sell their old Victorian dolls and it's like, eyes turn black at night. Sometimes I don't find it in the same place. Promise it doesn't moan at 4 a.m. every day. Totally not haunted. This is the first episode, though it was not the first episode that was filmed. They filmed the first few out of order so the cast had time to develop a relationship. Good move on their part, as this is likely why the chemistry immediately takes off from the beginning. Anyway, a dad is trying to be a good dad and buys his daughter, played by a very young Sarah Polly, a super creepy looking doll. The poor girl has a stepmom from hell and the doll makes her feel better, but it also makes her want to kill. As the episode goes on, you see that the doll is clearly possessing her. It's a fantastic first episode and shows the greatness ahead of us. Faith Healer. David Cronenberg doing what he does best. Body horror. A Faith Healer is proved to be nothing more than a charlatan until he finds a white costume glove in a dirty alley. 
Look, you can't just pick up whatever you find in an alley. Sure, it looks like a nice find, but it might be a cursed item. What's the deal with it? Well, thought you would never ask. Once you're touched by the glove, then whatever ailment you had passes the glove, and then you must tag your friend and give it to them or you yourself will perish. The effects in this one are grotesque and absolutely raise the fear factor. The Playhouse. Another episode dealing with child trauma. A brother and sister, played by young Lisa Jacob and Robert Oliveri, are neglected by their mother, who is more interested in finding her next boyfriend rather than caring for her children. The mother beats and berates the children and often leaves them to their own devices with no food or supervision. The siblings find solace in a wooden playhouse in their backyard. There's something more devious to the playhouse, though. It's alive and needs to be fed. The siblings are charged with feeding the playhouse children, so it will continue to give them anything their little hearts desire. It's hard to blame them, especially when you see the total winner their mom is. It also helped add more horrible imagery to my clown phobia. Yay. Tales I Live, Heads You Die. This is a huge episode in my opinion. The first season of the show was known for not really having it all together, but still pulls it off. The second season, though, is where the show finds itself. This episode centers on a coin that can bring people back from the dead, and it's not pretty. If you were rotting in a grave for over 40 years, that's how you come back. You don't get to come back all hot like Buffy or Jon Snow. A satanic cult leader, played by Colin Fox, he has one of my favorite parts in Tommy Boy, uses the coin to bring back magicians so they can summon the devil himself and rule the world. One of the gang themselves get taken, and it causes a serious rift that leaves them all in limbo. We knew the characters cared for one another, but a line was finally crossed. I'm leaving this vague because I want you to watch it if you haven't already, which means start from the beginning, don't just watch this episode, though I'm sure you understand that. The Poison Pen I've chosen another episode with Colin Fox in it. I can't help it that the episodes he's in happen to be two of the best ones. Mickey and Ryan travel to a monastery to visit a monk who is known as the Oracle of Death. Psst. He's not a monk. He's an ex-con. Anyway, when he writes a person's name down, they're doomed to certain death. Sure, it's silly in some parts, but man, was I invested in it. They try to pass Mickey off as a guy, and they don't try very hard. There's quite a few brutal deaths in this one, too. Ryan is the real winner in this one. Oh, and at the end, he jokes that he's going to use the pen to predict lunch. Only one way to find out. Hmm. Lunch. Let's order something really sick. This episode has a special place in my heart. Okay. Obviously, you don't have to have the same taste as me, so I'm sure there's an episode that stuck with you. Maybe it was Scarecrow or The Prophecies. Maybe a little Cupid's Quiver directed by Adam Egoyan. Leave it in the comments and let us know which ones have the curious goods. So, how did it end? Is this one a product of bad ratings and declining viewership? Nah. Complaints from religious groups and upstanding citizens at the tail end of the satanic panic brought the series to a close when it was moved to an 8 o'clock time slot to widen the audience. Unfortunately, that tactic did not pay off. The studio and Frank Mancuso Jr. ignored and fought off the mob as long as they could, but eventually let go, and season 3 was the last. The final episode aired on May 26, 1990, and there would never be any kind of proper send-off for the fans of the series or any kind of closure. Oh, and Ryan left after season two, and it's never the same. I love you, Ryan. Fun rumor time. Apparently, it's been said that Mancuso wanted to use the last episode to bring Jason and the Curious Goods gang together by making the final artifact Jason's mask. As cool as that sounds... I like the idea that the series is its own thing without the lore of Jason Voorhees. The show found life again on networks like Chiller and Sci-Fi. I'm sure you caught one of the marathons. I feel like there was a time on Chiller when Freddy's Nightmares played super early in the morning and Friday the 13th would come sometime shortly thereafter, I think. Chiller was legit for sure. I wound up rewatching a bunch of shows like these because of said marathons. It was really the best. If you want to take a trip down Haunted Memory Lane or just watch for the first time, the series is on DVD. Want something quicker or maybe can't buy any DVDs? Most of the episodes are on the YouTubes, but the quality is the best. And honestly, I tried watching it on YouTube, um, but the, the quality just kind of, the video quality just kind of drove me away from that. So I would not suggest it, but if you need to, it, it's, it's not going to kill anything. This is another series that opened doors for shows like Buffy, X-Files, and Warehouse 13. 
The letter has been actually accused of maybe borrowing a bit too much from Friday the 13th. I'll let you be the judge of that. Warehouse 13 has more of a comedy, sci-fi thing going on, in my opinion. Finding lost artifacts isn't an unknown concept in film and television. Everything is always borrowed or copied from or inspired by in some way. Friday the 13th was a rare artifact of time itself. It held its own in a time where horror shows were at their best and breaking new ground. The series should be ranked with all those we hold in high regard in the horror community. Friday the 13th breaks its own curse, and this is why we miss it so. Thanks to all my horror peeps out there who don't mind me recording for my bathroom. Just kidding. But seriously, thanks as always for taking the time to watch and share your own nostalgia with us. As always, if you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Horror Videos channel. Tell your friends who do this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support. Until next time. My favorite horror movie villain is probably a toss-up between Hellraiser and Freddy Krueger. One of these guys got a series that only ran for two seasons. If you're here, you probably already know which one it is. Welcome to prime time, bitch. Does anyone remember Freddy Mania? The character of Freddy Krueger sometime after part four became seriously marketable, even apparently to small children, which seems like both a great and terrible thing at the same time. Kruger went from basement dwelling fiend to your friendly neighborhood janitor. You know, the type that invades your dreams and makes you seriously consider taking meth. Even when delivering majorly delectable, cheesy lines, he was still creepy. I remember when Freddy vs. Jason came out, I was like, this is no contest. While Jason is obviously a badass in his own right in his own franchise, Freddy is a tough one to beat. Chop him up into pieces, and he still winks at you. The Superman vs. Goku debate, this ain't. But I digress. There was Freddy bubblegum, toothpaste, kids pajamas, yo-yos, a fright squirter, perverts. It was a weird time. You'd see this tactic with like strawberry shortcake or the Care Bears, but Freddy Krueger? I'm, I'm sorry. I've seen these movies. Do you think I really want to put Freddy's bubblegum or toothpaste in my mouth? What kind of nightmare scenario would this bring about? The Freddy hype is best shown in that part in Wedding Singer. You know, when Robbie's nephew, who looks like he's about five, is wearing his Freddy mask and gloves. He draws that picture of Robbie's ex with devil horns and Robbie says, Thanks, Freddy Krueger. That's not nice. Very creative though. How did any of us kids back then not turn out to be complete weirdos? Okay, maybe we are, but in the best kind of way. All that said, it was inevitable that someone would take a swing at bringing a TV series to the masses. The Nightmares team were sold that the show could be put on late night and they could get into some gruesome territory. This sounded appealing since the Elm Street film series remained one of the most creative. The setup for the series was basically a darker Twilight Zone with Freddy playing the Rod Serling part. The show would center on the residents of Springwood, Ohio. They would also be two-parters with the second half being somewhat driven off the first. For example, your main character could die and then her friend or boyfriend would be the main for the next episode. Freddy also isn't the main baddie in all the episodes, though you know in some way he's orchestrating the ongoings. Why people keep moving or residing in this town, I have no idea. Your town is cursed. Why do you expect different results? Do you guys not exchange stories? Does anyone read the local newspaper? I don't know about you guys, but Freddy is obviously the huge draw here. One of the best parts are the bumpers with Robert England bringing the slapstick. Also, not sure if anyone else liked this about it, but the bumpers would always freeze and the piercing music would play over them. Same thing every time. I just couldn't get enough of it. We also have to bring up that intro. I like how they slightly changed the screaming floating heads by removing one and then adding Freddy's floating head between the two so it's less, well, ridiculous. If it accomplishes that. What I enjoyed about Freddy was that he was like the ringmaster of the circus. He was the puppet master running wild through the dreams of insecure, vulnerable teens. He was the rock star of horror villains. MTV gave him his own countdown, he had an album of greatest hits that luckily he didn't sing too much on, and he was in videos for Fat Boys and Dokken. Nothing beats Dream Warriors. It's in your head now. You're welcome. The series is on par for other horror shows that debuted around that time. Most of it is cheesy as hell, but it's extremely watchable minus a few or so episodes. I've read reviews and people often give it a hard time for production values, quality of acting, etc. I think that's what makes it more appealing. There were times I got somewhat creeped out and then Freddy would either interject and start rapping, ha, huh, or hot dogs would start talking. 
Also, if you're like me, you will immediately absorb any horror anthology that presents itself. All of them. Give me all of them. Let's do all these episodes over all the horror anthologies. But that wouldn't be very fair to other series. Now under our favorite episodes. No more Mr. Nice Guy. The kickoff episode directed by Toby Hooper, we all know who that is, tells the story of how Fred Krueger became Freddy. It opens with a trial and shows him getting out of charges due to the cops not reading him his Miranda rights. Which is slightly different from the movie where the problem was a signature on the search warrant. The best part of this whole episode is when the townsfolk start to pour gasoline on Freddy and he laughs saying, You missed a spot. Why didn't no one listen to Lisa? You guys may be a hundred times worse. This episode is seen as what the rest of the series should have looked like and been like. We got an origin that played out instead of the breadcrumbs that had been tossed about here and there. Freddy's tricks and treats. This is possibly the creepiest of the episodes, in my opinion. Riska Hargitay plays a med student who would rather focus on her exams than hang out at the Halloween party in her dorm. After getting annoyed by her boyfriend, who is actually annoying and actually not real, she takes off to unwind in peace with some cadavers. After swearing she isn't scared of anything, especially Freddy, well, you know what happens next. Freddy can't resist messing with her. Eventually, this backstory with her slut-shaming grandma comes up. If grandma thinks she touches any boys, she's deemed unclean and has to wash her hands in scalding water. Mariska has a mild case of survivor's guilt due to the death of her grandma when she was younger. Her imaginary boyfriend attempts to help her with the trauma, but she continues to spiral out of control. The second half of the story is actually one of the more messed up ones. Two of her fellow classmates are studying dreams and attempting to record them. One of the classmates, we'll call him trash person, thinks Mariska is the perfect subject. He manipulates her into sleeping and diving deeper into the traumatic events of her past. When he finds out that Freddy is involved, he takes her to the boiler room to sleep. I repeat, takes her to the boiler room to sleep. This dude is an irredeemable piece of shit. He's one of these characters that you actually cheer Freddy on to murder. Rebel Without a Car. This is one of those good for her episodes. The first half of the story is about a guy who is obsessed with having the coolest car, so much so that he's willing to trade his girlfriend Connie for it. The guys in this series are real winners, let me tell you. Anyway, her boyfriend is an idiot and he dies. No one gets the girl. After dealing with her boyfriend and all of his baggage, she heads off to college on her own. Life continues to suck as the sorority she tries to join treats her like hot garbage and makes some really awful racist and classist remarks. Sorority sister, who looks kind of like Angela from The Office, tells her they're not accepting new pledges, all while two other sisters are snickering amongst each other in the background. Meanwhile, the sisters are told that the sorority money is drying up and that the girls will have to give up having a housekeeper and cook in order to make ends meet. Mm. They also don't qualify for a loan from the college because they aren't diverse enough. Surprise! The girls have a meltdown over the thought of having to cook and clean, so Angela comes up with a brilliant plan to bring Connie back as their new maid under the guise of being a sister. Connie is elated, but she doesn't know what we know. After being shoved out of the car, Connie is grabbed by a guy in an alley and we assume the worst. The scene cuts back to the kitchen in the sorority house where one of the sisters is having a smorgasbord of food. Grabs the other knife, and slits her throat. She forcefully shoves the sister's head into the food and says, eat it, bitch, in a very Veronica Sawyer kind of way. From there on, she basically kills the winches and burns the sorority down. At the end, the fire is laid on old wiring that we see Connie rescued from the fire. Really, this half of the episode makes you forget about the first. It's pretty magical. Love stinks. Did I choose this because my boyfriend Jeffrey Combs is in it? Well, It definitely doesn't hurt. The first half of the story is about a guy who looks and sounds like Bobby Briggs and has a hard time telling his girlfriend he loves her, especially after naughty time. The girlfriend leaves, then Bobby Briggs meets 80s Fiona Apple. 80s Fiona unfortunately turns out to be a basic instinct type lunatic. The end of the first story ends up as a switcheroo between the two girls and lets me down. The second half picks up with Bobby Briggs' friend who is more focused on his summer trip than his grades. His mom says he has to get a job to earn money for his summer trip and enlists his uptight uncle played by Jeffrey Combs. It's basically just a spin on Herbert West, which doesn't bother me in the least. His uncle gets him a job at the local pizza joint, which used to be the Beefy Boy Burgers. 
Everything in Springwood is cursed, even the eatery, so we know that this isn't going to go well. The uncle tries whipping his nephew into shape, and in an effort to make his life worse, he gives him the night shift. The night shift winds up being wildly successful, and the uncle gets jealous. So jealous that he decides to take his nephew's friends and make them part of the pizza ingredients. Of course, the new pizza recipe is great, but the nephew finds out it's people, then realizes the pizza oven is about to explode, and the end. It's not the end exactly. The nephew becomes the manager of the new pizza place and transforms into his dead uncle right before our very eyes. Silence is golden. Season 2 is definitely a roller coaster of emotions. Two and a half of the episodes really stand out to me, and this is one of them. Who's up for a little mime crime? That's right. The villain here is a mime. But instead of it being silly, it makes you feel uneasy. A trash talk radio DJ gets annoyed at some guy for pestering him, and instead of punching the annoying guy, he punches the mime. Terrible idea. The mime then starts showing up at the DJ's house unexpectedly. The wife of the DJ pleads with him to stop being a jerk, and the minute you think he's going to stop, he instead decides to taunt the mime on his radio show so he isn't seen as soft by his coworkers and listeners. Look, man, you can't fight a mime. You definitely can't threaten a mime. The mime will show up at your house and dig an imaginary grave and put your wife in it right after she apologizes for your wrongdoings. The DJ decides to call out the mime again, and the cool-headed mime shows up at the station and busts his neck with a rake piercing his vocal cords, rendering the DJ silent. When we see the DJ again, he is assisting in the studio and receives a black note with a yellow flower. The note reads, Silence is golden. Mwah. Cut to the second half focusing on the mime, we find out that he's not just some random psycho, that he's actually a full-fledged criminal. Long story short, his lady only wanted him for the take of the robberies and had been seeing the pawn shop guy the whole time. He shoots him. Now he's silent. The second half is not as good, but seeing it come full circle kind of is. Honorable mention of Brad Pitt and Bill Mosley's episode Black Tickets. John Cameron Mitchell's episode It's a Miserable Life. Lori Petty's episode Killer Instinct. Okay, fine. Most of season one gets an honorable mention. Obviously, these are my favorites. I'm sure you guys and gals have your own, so make sure you drop them in the comments. This show immediately got a ton of flack due to it being syndicated and released at such early times by the stations. It would come on around 4 or 5 p.m., which isn't ideal for a show like this one. Lots of angry moms using rotary phones in the Bible Belt making complaints about the Satanism, violence, sex, and gore. The show also wasn't Tales from the Crypt either. Unfortunately, they weren't on HBO. By the time they had gotten midway through the first season, the budget was non-existent. The execs didn't care about the film series and just wanted to squeeze as much money out of it as they could. What they actually squeezed out was the life of the show, and it went off the rails. It's great hearing the writers and directors talk about how much fun the show was, but also extremely cringy at the same time. Like many of the shows in our series, this one was canceled due to lack of viewership. The series got a second win between 2007 and 2011 on Chiller, which is where I started watching it because they would constantly marathon it. Eventually, after Chiller went away, the show found a spot on Robert Rodriguez's El Rey Network in 2015. Major shout out to everything on that. Watching it now is pretty difficult. I think it would fit beautifully on Shudder. You can find some of the episodes in different places if you want to relive the series. If you want to own it in its entirety, you might want to get creative. The series was originally meant to turn up as an episode per VHS thing as rentals were the new hotness. Some of the series did get released, but poor sales stopped a complete series release. The UK got the closest in 2003 when it put out a Blu-ray collection of the first season. Again, poor sales put a halt on season two. I doubt that anyone would now be interested in giving the series a true complete box set. But Freddy didn't go away, just a show. Several more movies came out for better or worse, and Freddy still continues to terrify after all these years. Maybe you don't think Freddy won between him and Jason, but you're wrong. Just kidding. Can we talk about the remake? What about the LJ Endgame? Oh, what about Johnny Depp's sick crop top and why men need to start rocking them again? Oh, oh, one more. What about the phone sex hotline? Ha, gotcha. I think what we miss about Freddy's Nightmares is that it's this over-the-top, low-budget nostalgia ride. It's fun, slightly politically incorrect, and it's extremely 80s. Some of us thrive on VHS trash and, of course, our undying love for more Freddy. Freddy's Nightmares, this is our toast to you. Hmm, bad joke.